there if you need. Oh, good. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be saved. Amen. That song always stirs my heart. Huh. Say so they think. See, a lot of people think Jesus is still dead. And boy, they put him on the cross all the time. He's not on the cross. He's on the right hand of the Father. Amen. And what a blessing that is. Amen. And so I thank God. I thank God for that we have a God that's alive and well. Amen. I don't have to carry him around. Amen. Amen. Like other people do, the little gods. I don't have to go in the booth and talk to a man, tell Jesus uh, what's in my heart, and confess to another man. What a blessing that is. And it's good to be saved. Amen. Amen. Well, as you see, I got sunburned. This white boy did. <laughs> Not really sunburned, but got red. Amen. And, um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I usually don't do that. And, and I got back to the Airbnb and said, man, what in the world's going on? And I remembered. So I got bit not too long ago by a tick and got limes and, I'm, I'm actually on um, antibiotics. And they told me the one thing you got to be careful of is stay out of the sun. <laughs> and all day I didn't wear a hat. I'm just out there <laughs> burning up. Amen. But I'm glad I ain't going to hell. Hallelujah. Yeah. Go to, I want you to go to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. If you can find them. Some of y'all get that in a minute. Yeah. Jonah chapter 4. Been up in the air about what to preach, and I believe this is where we need to go today and be a blessing to you. <clears throat> and so we had a good time. My dad didn't finish the story last night, and um, am I on here? Can y'all hear me? Okay. My dad didn't finish the story last night, but um, Joe Biden was at my graduation. Uh, Sleepy Joe. And uh, he spoke at my graduation, and so we got to meet him, take pictures with him. And my dad told him, he witnessed to him, but he told him, he said, you saved? And Joe smiled and said, yes, I, I'm saying I'm standing right there. He said, yeah, I'm saved. And dad said, man, he said, you're lying. <laughs> That's what he told him. He said, you're a politic. You know what politic means? Poly means many, and ticks mean bloodsuckers. <laughs> and he laughed. He laughed. And dad double dogged there and witnessed to him, told him this, what happened to him, how he got saved, and double dogged there and would come hear him preach at his church. He promised he would. He never showed up. Uh, so I know this that our president's heard the gospel, Amen. but he's rejected it. And uh, boy, I'm telling you, America's in a bad place. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, listen, if it if it's, has to go this way for the Lord to come back, praise the Lord. Amen. I want him to come back. I do. I want the Lord to come back, man, yeah. and be with us, and or we be with him, and that would be a blessing. All right, Jonah, I, I'm, I'm going to explain some things about Jonah before we get to chapter 4. And, uh, and Jonah uh, is a wild character. The book of Jonah is not just about Jonah, but it's about us, too. And uh, I'm going to show you some things here, hopefully be a blessing to you and help you. Uh, we live in an age that our... Churches are splitting like crazy. Our children of the second generation has run off from God. Uh, they don't want nothing to do with God. Has blogs about us, Bible-believing people. Uh, they're against God. They say they don't believe in God. And there's a problem. See, Jonah, Jonah here in chapter 1, he felt the pressure. Excuse me, he left the presence of the Lord. Jonah left the presence of the Lord in chapter 1. Uh, it is amazing to me that uh, Jonah, the Lord told him to go to Nineveh, this great city, and Jonah rise up, and listen, if you're a preacher, here's, it, it's homiletics already here in, in verse 3 of chapter 1. He flees, he finds, and he pays the fare. He pays the fare. That's what happens to most people. When they leave the presence of the Lord. Can I tell you tonight, don't leave the presence of God. You say, what are you talking about? Your church? I don't know how many people you've seen come in and out of this church. I've seen a lot come in and out of mine. I've seen a lot come out in and out of my dad's. Hey, listen, can I encourage you? Don't leave the presence of the Lord. 
uh, the, the, uh, Joppa was still in the presence of God. He went down to Joppa. Joppa's a beautiful place. It, the name is called, the place called Beautiful. And listen, this church is a beautiful place. Amen. Man, y'all dying on me. Do you believe your church is a beautiful place? Amen. I listen, it's a beautiful place. This is where God wants you. This is where you're going to learn the word of God. Listen, if you study Joppa, guess what? Saul, uh, uh, excuse me, um, Saul, I'm not, yeah, Saul, uh, Paul, the, uh, Peter, I can't give my words right. Amen. Peter, wow, yes, Peter, Peter goes to Joppa. Yes. And when Peter goes to Joppa, he raises people from the dead. People get saved in Joppa. Matter of fact, he gets a vision in Joppa. You know, we get in Joppa, a place called Beautiful. Listen, if you don't understand Acts, a transitional book, when Paul shows up, God has already touched the heart of Peter. That Peter has already seen that the Gentiles can receive the Holy Ghost without baptism. And he's seen that. Hey, listen, have you ever been to church and the preacher's preaching and God just reveals something to you? Yeah. Don't leave the place called beautiful. Amen. That's Joppa. Amen. You know what happens to Christians? They get to the place and they start to flee in their heart and they go find something else to do so they can't make it to church and they find and they pay the fare. You will pay the price. Don't leave the presence of the Lord. Amen. Don't leave the presence of the Lord. Boy, he gets on that ship. And boy, when he gets on that ship, boy, the winds begin to blow. He's in the bottom. He's, he's depressed. He's sleeping. And boy, the men get scared. And here they are. They're all scared. And, and they wake him up. And the captain says, hey, oh, you sleeper. Uh, listen, let's, let's pray to your God. And, and boy, the lot falls upon him, and he tells him. He tells him. He says, hey, listen, this is because of me. You know what he tells him? He said, I serve the God that controls all this. Amen. He knew it. And boy, they, they said, man, oh, why did you do this? It, it, it says this, why hast thou done this? Boy, there's storms that show up in churches, show up in our lives, and, it, and we're trying to figure it out, and then finally somebody like an Aiken shows up, and you realize there's sin in the church. Why did you do this to us? Why did you do it to us? And boy, these men are scared. And so no, Jonah does. Jonah tells these people, he said, all you have to do is throw me overboard. Winds are blowing, water coming in, rain coming down on them. All you got to do is throw me overboard. I, I, I thought, why didn't you just jump? Because God's trying to show you, you got to throw the things out of your life that's bringing the storm. The things that are coming in your life and the storms are happening. Hey, listen, when storms come in my life, I'm like, Lord, what do I got in my life that I got to throw overboard? But you know what most people do? Nevertheless, they try to row to shore and they can't make it. They can't make it. The Lord won't let them make it. You know, that's the type of you enabling somebody. Now listen, let me tell you something here, and I'm a, I, and listen. That's good. I have people in my church, and I preach this, and they got upset. But I'm telling you, people get upset. Stop enabling your grown kids. Yeah. Amen. If they're living in your home and ain't going to church, you're gonna have to leave. That's right. Amen. Me and my dad had a talk with my little brother. He told you last night, and we had a talk, and I said, Dad, you're gonna have to let them go. He goes, I know, I'm just waiting on what God wants, when God wants me wow. to. And when God, and when God, and he let him go, he threw him overboard. Yeah. Wow. Listen, some, there's parents in here, I know you love your kids, and I'm happy you love your kids, but you got to stop enabling them and let God deal with Amen. them. That's right. Amen. And get on your face and say, God, have mercy. Have mercy. Yeah. Have mercy. 
Boy, uh, there's other things. There's people in your life that are your enabler. I had a man come to me while I preached about enabling people. He said, I've been trying to get these people to come to church. He's been bringing their kids. He said, but I've been giving them like $200 every week. He said, I walked in the house. The kids are drunk. They're drunk. They were buying liquor. He's in my office shaking. He said, I've been, I've been enabling them. I said, yes, you have. Listen, remember this. What you do to get people in the church is what you got to keep yeah, them right. in church yeah. with. Right. That's right. Right. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having Sunday school. Nothing wrong with having so, uh, a bus ride. Nothing wrong with some of that stuff. But if you got to keep people in for that, oh, we got to have this certain type of music. And I got to be careful what I say here to keep them. And listen, the, it, they'll control you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They'll control the church. Yeah. You can't let that happen. Nevertheless, they rode, and then finally, they took him and they threw him overboard. He said, why? Because he left the presence of the Lord. Yeah. You get to chapter 2, he felt the pressure of the Lord. Boy, he gets swallowed up by that fish there, and boy, he gets the pressure of the Lord. And Man, I've seen people. Oh, every time things happen, when the pandemic happened, my church grew. My offerings went up. I was a little strange. But when everything got fine, they all left. Yes. That is true. So what happens is when you start feeling the pressure of the Lord because you, you're paying the fare and you're, you, 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 you found a way to get out and you come back to church. We had that recession. I was at my dad's. Uh, church was packed out and there was a recession. People started coming back because they were losing their jobs. They were losing their homes. They needed their electric paid and they're on the altar and stuff. But I'll never forget, we have a blind guy named Jesse Craigle. He went to PBI. He's blind. He flies all over, preaches and sings, and he's over here playing the piano. And he, he, he's, he's, a white, he's, he's Italian, but we call him the white, uh, what is it, um, uh, Ray Charles or whatever it is. What is, it, what is his name? The guy goes like this. Yeah. One time we put one time we put sunglasses on him. And let him do it. Amen. But anyways, he's over there playing, you know. And and this lady come in. They, they are losing their job in the house. And she was drunk. I mean, you can smell it. She was drunk. And boy, she came over here in front of the Jesse Wise playing. We're all singing. There's about two hundred and some people in there, and they're all singing. And then she starts doing this around the piano. Well, my dad, he just thought it was funny. I'm up there. I'm getting angry. I mean, she just, but you can see Jesse. He's like smelling liquor, and he don't know what's going on. And so I go down. I come down, and everybody's laughing. Some people are laughing, and they're, sing, and they're singing, and she's still this. Why the piano go? That's the dancer. I come up. I said, ma'am. She said, yes. She didn't even stop. She said, yes, sir. She came on this. I said, we don't do that here. Can you go sit with your husband? She goes, what do you mean? I said, we don't do that here. Can you go sit with your husband? And she goes, okay. <laughs> and she, she goes, sit with her husband. After church, she was crying to me. I offended her, tried to kiss me and everything else. All this crazy stuff. But listen, she come back the next Sunday, and she was all embarrassed and apologizing. But listen, when things got better, they were gone. That's what happens to people. Finances get a little rough. They come back to church. Kids have problems. They come back to church. They get rough. You say, why? They're feeling the pressure of the Lord. But you know what happens to Jonah here? He feels the pressure of the Lord. But if you read his prayer, he never repents. He said, I'll, rep I'll return back to the temple. But he doesn't say, God, I've sinned against you. Not like David. Lord, cleanse me. Wash me. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Not like David. Most people who feel the pressure of the Lord usually don't repent like David did. They repent like Jonah did. So here, here he is. He leaves the presence of the Lord. And then he finds the pressure of the Lord. And then he finally preaches the message of the Lord in chapter 3. He preaches this message, and boy, I tell you what, he comes in this great city of Nineveh, and he preaches eight words. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Can you imagine here in San Diego, if your pastor got out there where we were today and said eight words that didn't even mention God? 
The word God's not even mentioned in it. Yeah. Wow. Right. And he just goes out on that street like y'all street preach and says eight words and this whole town begins to repent and turn upside down. Jonah had, to, in the Bible, you'll find Jonah had the greatest revival that anybody ever had. You wouldn't believe all these churches would be filled. You'd be building bigger churches. Or, or, or that place that you showed me where they had them, them uh, conventions. You'd have to use that and, and mother places. If the whole city, listen, the cows were even upset because they couldn't eat. They put ashes on them. And, and everybody was repenting. Everybody was getting right with God. Everybody. Eight words. Man, I wish I could preach eight words and watch the Holy Spirit show up. I preach. I'm a long preacher sometimes. I preach an hour and a half in our church and nobody move. Boy, I tell you what, I would love to preach eight words and see that and have that kind of great revival. Wouldn't you love to talk to your, your family members that are lost and you just say eight words to them and they get saved? Yeah. Well, that's power. Yeah. He finally did it. Hey, see, listen, Jonah wasn't scared of Nineveh. He didn't like Nineveh. Yeah. They were the city that put his people into bondage. And he didn't like them. God had him come out there as he ran, got there real fast. He looked like a wild man. If you ever studied anything of men that have been swallowed by whales, and it's true, it does happen. Yeah, that's right. The acid, what it does to their skin and what they make it look. He was a wild man. He said eight words. They believed it, man. <laughs> believed it. But we get to chapter four. Hmm. See, he left the presence of the Lord. He felt the pressure of the Lord. He finally preached the message of the Lord. And now he has a problem with the Lord. Look at verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Very angry. What I want to preach on tonight is this. Being displeased and angry. Listen to me. Being displeased and angry at an outcome that the Lord allows. You being angry. You say, well, I'm not angry. Well, listen, let me say something to you. There's times that you can hide that anger. Yeah. One of the biggest things that are killing our, our Bible-believing church is anger. Yeah. I have a whole message on anger. Mm. It lies in the bosom of a fool. That's right. That's it. I, listen, when I moved to Messina... Ten years ago, I read a book called Why Am I So Angry? It changed my life. I could take you to place in my house there, Brother uh, Hilton, where I repented. I didn't think I was that kind of an angry guy, but it, God got a hold of my heart. Amen. And I realized how angry I was. Amen. And us Bible believers are the most angriest people sometimes. Come on. And it ends up coming back on us. Right. Yes, it does. Listen, number one, being displeased and angry at the outcome that God has allowed, you get the wrong thinking. Oh, that's right. Brother Hilton said this the other day about when people get angry, they think they, if they would just stop and think for a minute. But the problem is we don't stop and think. We just react. Boy, our sisters or brothers do something, and you go, you little jerk, shut up. <laughs> you know why my brother was so mad at my dad and me? He hated me. My brother handed me a letter that, uh, at the revival two weeks ago. Yeah. He said he found it. He said, I think I was talking about you. He said, I hated him. I want to kill him. Whoa. He was so angry. In a Bible-believing church, the loving parents. I opened that thing up and read it and I thought, my soul. He said, I don't think I was in my right mind. No, that's what anger does. It doesn't put you in the right mind. You get the wrong thinking. You know what Jonah does there? 
Jonah says this. He says, he says, God, did I not tell you when I was in my land that you would be gracious? Yeah. He knew it. He knew how God was. You know, we have, we have Bible-believing Christian kids and Bible-believing preachers that know how God is, but they're still angry. Boy, you can cover it up. You can put it to the side. Listen, if you don't take care of it, it will show up. You know what bothers me? A guy that's lived and preached, and I know hundreds of them, gone to church, took their families to church, did all these things, and when they get older, their kids and wife are so bitter that they're out. They're so bitter, they're out. And I said, I remember when he would preach. I remember when he was at that church. And in their older years, they're not living for God anymore. You say, why? Because there was a seed of anger he never got right. And every time something would happen and bring it back up, he never took care of it. And when he didn't take care of it, brother, guess what's happened? They're out. We got kids that have anger. And parents, I'm telling you, you better talk to your children. You get the wrong thinking. You think everybody's against me. Nobody likes me there. That message to the preacher, he knew and he knew. I had a man get mad at me because he smoked and I preach against smoking. He also, I didn't know this until he left. And I finally went and seen him. Most, most Christians don't have enough guts to go tell their pastor why they're leaving. That bothers me. I can tell you a story, a woman in my church up there right now, she left the, the uh, St. John Episcopal Church. She had gotten saved, and she was looking for a church, and on our sign, if you're shopping for a church, we're open on Sunday. <laughs> she showed up on a Wednesday night, uh, and boy, it's a long story, but anyway, she gets, she gets in there, and she's reading her Bible, and she's like, man, I like this, and she left the other church. You know what she did? She made an appointment with the, uh, the pastor woman and said, I'm leaving and going to a Bible-believing church. Amen. More character than somebody that's grown up in our churches. Amen. I took my hat off to her. You know, she, that, that priest, uh, that St. Piscopal John's, uh, I don't even want to call her, the preacher woman, whatever. She asked her, she said, well, where are you going? She goes, I'd rather not tell you, but I'm going where they're teaching me the Bible. Amen. And they open up the Bible. <laughs> and she said, she said, well, this is what the preacher lady said. She said, you're not going to Mormons or Jehovah's Witness, are you? Because I tell you, I wouldn't go there. I was like, well, that's weird. It was good advice. You get that wrong attitude. And this man, what he did was, I went and seen him and he told me. He was upset because he, he worked on at nights. And I had the Lord's Supper, and he had asked me, and I had forgot about it. That he, he wanted to do it on Sunday morning. He wanted to do it. And that's a blessing, having the Lord's Supper. And I did it on Sunday night. Well, he was upset. He kept that in his heart. He was angry. He never come talk to me. Wow. And then it builds up something else, and then something else, and something else. All those things I could have fixed. Yeah. Brother, I'm sitting on his, uh, a vacation porch talking to him, and he told me something I never saw as a pastor. Never even saw it. And when he told me, I looked at him. I said, brother, why didn't you tell me before? I am so sorry. I apologize. You're exactly right. I was wrong in that. I didn't even see that wow. perspective. Wow. Yeah. He's so angry at me. I'll see him in the, in, in the store. He won't even talk to me. His wow. wife will. Oh, yeah. Wow. And I love all, I would call and leave me. Hey, I'm just praying for you. Love you. Miss y'all. They never came back. They're angry. You get the wrong thinking that everybody's against you. You think God's against you. You think God's after you. And then you do what Jonah did. Wrong thinking, wasted time. He went and sat on the east side. Instead of discipling people, having another service and preaching to them, he sits up there on the east side there, and he just watches the sea. Yeah. Hey, listen, some of you are angry at people left here and hurt you. Some of you kids are angry at people that left here and said bad things about your pastor and his wife. And you'll get on Facebook, and you'll, you'll, 
You're one of those spies on Facebook. You're checking them out. They're Instagram. Somebody else you know that's friends with them. What, what are they doing? You're wasting your time. Amen, brother. I had people leave my church. I'm not trying to find out. It'll come back to me no matter what. But I ain't trying to find out. It's a waste of time. That's right. It is. You're wasting your time. You're staying up at night and, and uh, popping pills and not being able to sleep because you're so angry. And listen, you'll be fine for a while. And then that subject come up or that person's name comes up. And boy, for hours, you'd just be thinking about it. Listen, don't look at me like a bunch of owl, uh, owls yeah. on a tree branch. <laughs> I do the same thing. Amen. It's called flesh. Yeah. And it's a battle in our own minds yeah. that we have to say, oh, God, would you just get those thoughts out? I, I don't want to waste time with this because I can't change the situation. And I know I'm hurting. And boy, you start praying, God, kill him. God ruined their life. Wow. Then you hear about their kids falling away. Well, that's what they get. Oh. That's what happens. You might not say it out loud, but in your heart, it's there because that anger is there. It's good preaching. I'm telling you, you better take care of that anger. Amen. You better get it out. Yes. It'll ruin your kids. That's why a lot of them sit in this seat here. Right. And their kids end up in this seat here. Right. Why we got, listen, as much Bibles we have out all on social media, all over the place, Bibles being given, still the best written book yeah. in the world. Yeah. People can say, why do we have so many of our kids out? They're angry. I believe that's the number one thing. Another thing is sin. Listen, I was a preacher's kid sitting in people's homes that were going to my dad's church on Sunday afternoon and at lunchtime when I'd sit down and eat with them because I was there to play with their kids. They would tell me everything my dad was doing wrong at the church. I'd be mad. Come home, I'd tell my dad, and he'd take me to the couch, and we'd get down, and we'd pray over him. It helped that anger. You see somebody, and you, 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 you avoid them. I'm telling you, folks, it's a pandemic. Displeased and angry at the outcome. And really, who you're angry with is God because he allowed it to happen. Can you forgive them? No, I can never forgive them, preacher. Yes, you can. Yeah. It's going to take some work. Yeah. It's going to take you getting on your face. Right now, I got some preachers upset with me, run me down. I broke fellowship with an old preacher that was, he, he was running me down. We were doing camp together. He was running me down. And I broke fellowship with him because he said some filthy things in front of my wife and me about our marriage bed. And he said some other filthy things two other times. And in nine years, I'm done. Wow. Yeah. I've had to confront him yeah. a couple different times. I'm talking about a guy three times older than me, or I would say two times older than me. Yeah. I should be learning from him. And yes. these guys know how he is. And guess what? They turned on me. Wow. Got in front of their church and, and said, well, we're not going back to the camp because this made up something they never talked to me about they said they were upset with. I found out because their kids were telling other kids that were telling me. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? Their kids were telling other kids, putting that anger, frustration, disappointment in their hearts. They said, and listen, I didn't know at the time that this man was having problems in his own church, that his church 
end up confronting him about things in his church, and he resigned, and he blamed me and said, I split him and ran him out of his church. And you know how hard that is sometimes, riding down the road thinking, God, you just get them. Especially a guy that I was really close with. I was real close with him. Won't answer my calls. Helped his son. Son was backslidden. Good boy, but I took him down to the altar at camp. He told me, help my boy. Great soccer player. Took him down to the altar at camp. God got moving. And I said, brother, I, I appreciate you. You're very respectful. You're, you're kind. You're talented. You're handsome. You're all these things, but you're not spiritual. That boy just broke. Went home, apologized to his soccer team, led two of his boys to the Lord, got all fired up. I did all the, I was trying to help his boy, always encouraging him. He's angry inside. He never talked to me about things. Never came to me and said, preacher, that's what's happened to our Bible-believing churches. There's not very many of us. And we're splitting. You say, why? Because of anger. Not dealing with it. So you get wrong thinking, wasted time. And guess what? Worldly things are more important to you than godly things. You know what he does? He gets on that hill. He builds a booth. He's more worried about building something to cover his head than he is building something for God. You get angry, you'll start worrying about building something else to cover your mind than to get the word of God. See, because that son is a type of Jesus Christ and it was hot on his head because God was trying to convict him, so he builds a booth to cover that mind. And we do that. We come to church and the preaching comes down, but there's a booth. Because you built a booth to bring in the church service. And God can't move because you're comfortable. You're very comfortable in your booth. Sitting there watching everybody else. Well, I know about them and I know about that. A lot of church kids do it. Because they see us hypocritical, like my daddy preached about last night. And it's sitting in that booth and you, you don't feel the heat of the sun. When you need the heat of the sun yeah, to convict your heart and yeah. show you your flaws. Amen. And then God, he builds a gourd. And the Bible says he was exceedingly glad. Oh, man, I've seen them. They built their own booth. And then God bless them, and they're so excited. But then when God takes it away, boy, they're angry. See, what happens is that anger builds up when maybe you're younger. Some of you here had something happen when you were younger, and it, you never got it right, and you stay there and stay there. And listen, later going down the years, let me tell you something. These older preachers can tell you more than me. We've seen them. I've seen them that used to preach the house down. I've seen them that was best Sunday school teachers or best deacons. But when they got older, they got out yes. because they never dealt with that anger back there. And it built up and built up and built up and built up. And boy, when they got here, they were angry about something. And you're going to be angry at him. You're going to be angry at her. You're going to be angry at that boy there. You're going to be angry at that boy right there. And his little girl, you're going to be angry at them. That's what happens in churches. You say, how do you know? I was the pastor's kid that watched it. I watched them shoot the arrows in the back of my mom. I watched them shoot the arrows in the back of my dad. I watched them shoot the arrows at us. People that would sacrifice and do things and then they would shoot at us because they never got their anger right. We had a man that got so angry at my dad, he went into the military and, and uh, uh, learned how to shoot because he was going to kill us. He came back and told us. Oh. He was going to scout out. He knew where we live. But you know what happened? His wife lost a baby, and he lost a baby. 
come crawling back to my dad and said, Preacher, I remember watching that little casket. Watch them weep over that baby. That boy never got his anger right. He beat on his wife. I remember looking at her and said, he hit you? He stopped coming to church. He lost his ever-loving mind. His daughter, one of the, one of the uh, a good girl in my dad's church, married to a good boy, serving God. And I asked her all the time, how's your family? They're a mess. How's your mama? How's your dad? They're not good. I said, what? Anger. Wrong thinking, wasted time. And worldly things mean more to you than the spiritual things. Listen to me. God raised that thing. And then he brought a worm. Now let me tell you something. God will bless you when you're angry. And you'll be exceedingly glad. But he'll put a worm in your life. He said, what's that worm supposed to do? It's going to eat you up. Boy, it's going to eat that little, that little thing, that problem, whatever it was. It's going to eat you up. You're mad at that ex-preacher. You're mad at that church. You're mad at this person. You can't stand them. And, you, and down deep in your heart, if they failed, it would be okay. But you would act like, oh, man, I hate that that happened. But it eats you up so much inside. Do you understand why we have all the school shootings? Have you ever studied that out? They're demon possessed because of anger. Anger brings murder. Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He raised their babies from the dead. He healed their blind. Anger brings murder. The Bible says over there, be angry and sin not. Semicolon. No period. What's that mean? Continue, right? Neither give place to the devil. When you're angry and you don't take care of it, you're giving place to the devil. He's not talking the lost in that passage. He's talking the saved. He'll eat you up. It'll dry you up. And then you want to give up. You want to give up. If I could have the piano player come. <clears throat> there's somebody in here, there's people in here, and you're not going to want to come to the altar, but I encourage you to come no matter what. But you're angry about something. You're angry about the way you were raised. You're angry about the problem you had. Now listen to me. If I had my little girl Gracie here, I have a little 11-year-old girl. You can start playing whenever, brother. I got a little girl, Gracie, 11 years old. We had a small little church. We're doing good. We're running about 80. I started having people leaving. You can start playing, brother. Had a couple come to my church. Listen to me. Trying to help. They end up hurting my church and leaving. 26 people left the church. Brother Hilton. In that 26 were all the kids that was in Sunday school. And for like two and a half years, matter of fact, all the way until I resigned, we still hadn't had kids in Sunday school. Every once in a blue moon, a kid would show up. Four years. My wife and my son had to teach to my two baby girls. I call them the littles for years. And we would talk to them about when the church had problems. We would talk to them about and make sure their hearts were good. We're very close to our children. And we talk to them and we ask them to open up. We, we ask them open-end questions. We want to hear what's in their heart so we could take the Word of God and guide that little heart. 
Because, hey, parents, we get hurt, but our young people get hurt in the midst of it too. And I'll never forget one Sunday morning, we had a family that was coming that had some kids. And my little Gracie come down. She was probably about eight and a half, maybe nine years old at the time. Brother Paul, she came down and she, I'm studying Saturday. And she kissed me. She said, Daddy, we're going to have kids in Sunday school. We're going to have kids in Sunday school. We ain't had kids in Sunday school for a long time. My wife and son would do it like there was 100 kids in there. They would sing like there was 100 kids in there. They would teach with all their hearts. My wife told my son, we're going to teach them like there's a lot of kids in there. Amen. You know, we had to teach our kids, hey, we might be alone here up in Messina, but we got a God that cares. We got a God that loves us. He's more important than any friend you could ever have. Amen. And that, that night, I said, honey, they might not come to Sunday school See, they were adopted kids, and they were new in the family, and I knew this couple. She said, well, they might, though. And so that Sunday morning, I dismissed. We sing with the kids. We dismiss like y'all do to Sunday school. And I remember our steps go down back there when you walk into the church. And I remember watching Gracie. She's smiling, kept on looking back, and she's smiling at the little kids. And then when she went down the steps, Brother Hill, she looked, and I saw her face go, she knew they weren't coming. I talked with a sorrowful heart. I said, oh, God, please help my baby. See, I don't want my children to end up getting angry and leaving the God that I serve and love. Amen. Amen. I remember watching her go down and remember coming up. She brought them some candy and she played with them after service. And then what happened was this. They left. And man, we're, we're in the church, turn off lights, and we're talking. And then all of a sudden, little Gracie looks up at mommy and me. She says, I'm angry. I said, what are you angry at? She started crying. She said, I'm angry at so-and-so that left our church and took all the kids. Sister, it was just two years later, and we've always checked with our heart. But that little seed was still there. Me and my son began to weep as my wife took her side and comforted her and showed her Bible and talked to her, prayed with her. We had to go sit out in the car. So why do you tell us that story? I tell you that story because there's many Christians that hold anger towards somebody. Maybe it's a husband, a wife, an ex-wife. I had a lady in my church who was so angry at her ex-husband. When she got right with God and started reading her Bible, she got up in front of the church and told him. She wrote a letter to him and asked him to forgive her for all the time she didn't submit to him. That was not against God's word. God has blessed that lady. She is free from that anger. Amen. Folks, the altar's still open. I'm going to have you stand. Maybe you need to come down and pray over somebody. Maybe you need to come down and say, Lord, don't let that seed of anger get in my heart. Don't let it get in my children. Lord, help our pastor. You know, it's hard as a pastor. You know what makes me mad? I mean, people attack me, but my pa the pastor's wife, it's even harder for them. It's harder for those kids. You have somebody attack their, their daddy that's up there giving his life and taking his time away from them. Say, God, please help my children. Help our church kids. Help our church. Help us to be a joyful. The joy of the Lord is our what? Strength. Being, dis dis being angry and upset at something God has allowed. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. God, help us, Lord. And God, you know I battle with anger sometimes. And I got to get on my face and I got to get alone and talk to you. Say, God, I need help. <laughs> when they attack my wife or attack my children, attack my people I love, Lord, please help me not to keep that seed of anger. The Bible says, God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth. That 
shall we also reap? And God, I don't want to reap what anger brings. God, help this church not to reap what anger brings. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.